Hey, this is Doug from Foscale Models, and today we're going to make a concrete seawall for our little canal scene here. Uh, to do that, we need to make a mold uh, and pour in some plaster. Uh, but to first, before we do that, we need our measurements. Um, we want to make this one piece uh, so there's no seam. So it's going to be 16 inches long, and we're going to get our height by just making a tick mark here. And we want it a little above the uh, height of the land surface, so we'll go about an eighth inch above that. So that is the height of our wall. So it's going to be 1 and 7 eighths by 16. Uh, we're going to make a mold out of foam core uh, using just foam core and a glue gun. Pour some plaster in there and then we're going to uh, add some cracks and some broken pieces and weather it. Okay, the first thing we need to do uh, in making our plaster mold is uh, lay out the footprint of the wall. And as we said, it's uh, 16 inches by one and seven eighths high, or you could just use your marker to mark your height. Now this is foam core. The sides of the mold will also be foam core. Uh, foam core is good because it's, it's a relatively smooth surface and you can pop the plaster out pretty much without using a mold release. Uh, so that's why we like to use it. Uh, you could use a machine square here, but I'm pretty confident that that's straight enough uh, for what we're doing. Now, we need to make a, uh, a moat wall, or just uh, sides to this shape here to keep our plaster from pouring out. Uh, but to do that, we need to determine the thickness of the wall. And in this case, I'm going to make it one quarter of an inch thick. Um, any thicker, and it's going to look out of scale. I mean, an HO scale, that's about two feet or more. Uh, for a seawall, that's pretty good. Uh, but anything else will really look kind of um, out of place. Anything too thin will break. So what we need to do is make some quarter inch strips in our foam core here. So I'm just making a couple of tick marks. And you want them longer than the longest side of your, your box, uh, your mold box here. So if our mold is 16 inches long, we'll make them about 17 and a half or 18. And when you're cutting foam core, don't ever try to cut all the way through. Make a few passes, you'll get a much cleaner cut. Okay, so we're going to use our glue gun, put a bead down the length of the rectangle, and working pretty quickly because this does dry quick. Well, you don't want a bumpy, um, a bumpy join. We're using our pencil line, and we're going flush at one end and longer at the other. And I'll show you why that's important in a minute. Um, the easiest way to make a simple box mold, and I will draw it uh, so you can see it a little better. This is your shape. We don't want to spend time measuring accurately um, the sides of each of this, of this uh, square. So if we put one end flush and we go a little longer and we make our way around, kind of like a pinwheel, None of these four pieces have to be measured uh, accurately. So it's just a time saver. The first thing we're going to do before we pour our plaster is add some dirt. Now the dirt is going to um, translate into some crumbling patches of concrete once it's dried and we pour this on top of it. So you want to do it just kind of randomly, um, not in a pattern. We don't want it to look too repetitive. You can concentrate in one area and then just a couple of spots. And this will just give it a little bit more texture, a little bit more variety. Uh, I'm using some fine ballast and some finely sifted uh, soil 
So it's got a little variety of size of pebbles and gravel in it. So this technique with the dirt uh, in the mold was uh, developed by my friend Dennis Gordon, who does all these great concrete walls that look like they've been uh, there for quite a long time. Uh, and they look quite realistic. So I'm using Hydrocal. You can use Plaster of Paris. Uh, it doesn't matter. I'm not measuring it. Uh, I'm just making it until have a consistency of um, pancake batter. And we're using our flexible bowl just so it's easy to pour and easy to break up the dried plaster once we're done and clean it up. Uh, if I haven't made enough, I'll just quickly make some more. And when we pour this, we don't want to pour it directly on top of the pile of dirt as it will uh, just kind of push it away. So find a blank spot and then just let it work itself over on its own. Okay. Looks like we made just enough. Now you can see it's... Uh, heaving over the sides, take a spackle knife, or taping knife in this case, and skim the top flat. Um, we like to do this at 45 degrees, it seems to work better. I'm just going to let that dry for a bit. So the mold's not quite ready yet. And one good way to check uh, is to grab a piece of the excess on the outside of the mold. And if it just comes apart like that, uh, no doubt when you take the sides off, the wall will crumble the same way. So it's clearly not set yet. So we're going to give it some more time. It's time to remove our uh, plaster casting of this wall. Um, is a good chance it will break in some places. It is a long, thin piece, uh, so it doesn't have a lot of strength to it uh, laterally. So we're going to be a little careful. And if it does break, um, we're just going to embrace those cracks and incorporate them into our uh, weathering of this decrepit wall, which it's supposed to be anyway. But we'll try to minimize it. So I'm using just an X-Acto knife to cut away all of my excess uh, Hydrocal or plaster. You can peel this back a bit. This comes off rather easily. Once again, this is another reason why it's great to use the foam core for mold making. I've got some newsprint under here. Uh, this will just make cleanup a little easier. I'm going to try to just loosen this a little bit. And it should give, hopefully, and it seems to be. There you go. So you can rub the uh, residue from the foam core off with your fingers here. And get a nice clean piece. Now here's our gravel and our dirt in these patches. So I'm going to try to take out as much as I can with my finger. And 
see it starts to reveal a um, sort of a pothole effect or a crumbling concrete effect, which is exactly what we wanted. You can even pick out some with your knife. So the first thing I like to do when I'm shaping the wall or adding uh, some cracks and weathering is just take off this hard edge. It's just too much of a 90 degree, it's too clean and perfect. So you could take your knife and just kind of give it a little chamfer, which is a little bevel. This is our top top uh, edge of the wall. So that's what we're just gonna take this out, edge out. It also gives it a little bit of scale too. We'll do the same thing for the other side. And then we can put in some cracks. Now cracks uh, shouldn't be random. Uh, they should have a little a little uh, philosophy to them in that, um, I'll give you an example. Uh, we don't want cracks, uh, this is our wall. We don't want cracks that go like this, go like this, and then go like this. We don't want them to cross over like that. Uh, in some cases, that's probably okay, but um, generally, if we have a surface, let's get you here. If we have a crack, we want it to, we want our hand to kind of meander just the way the crack would. And then we want another crack to come in and meet that crack. And then maybe where these two lines happen, there's a little divot because you've got water coming in from different places and taking out uh, that intersection of material. And then another crack over here. and so on and so on. We just don't want a grid effect. And we have, so we have these uh, broken patches of concrete that have crumbled away. It actually can be sort of a guide to where the cracks uh, would happen. So if we have this deterioration in the concrete, there's gonna be a lot of water damage starting here. So the water would pull, would come down the wall, kind of collect in the little lip that this goes into. So that's where our first crack might be. And you can see I'm turning the blade. I'm not really drawing with it uh, the way you would a pencil. I'm giving it a little pivot, see that, as I go. So it's two moves. It's the line itself plus the pivot. And that will help you um, keep from making a um, more of a crisscross effect and more of an unnatural looking line. So right here, I've got my intersection of these three lines. So I'm gonna take out the material there. Now I've got a bit of a divot in the wall that's more natural looking. So I'm taking out some chunks myself here um, that might happen where water collects. Uh, the top edge of the wall is pretty important as well. We don't want it to be perfectly clean. So whatever cracks are coming up the wall should then find their way across the edge. And also just, it will break up the monotony of one solid piece of concrete.
you know, all of these cracks will reveal themselves a little bit more when we put an ink wash, uh, which we'll be doing next as the first base in our, our weathering and coloring. So here's another tool we can use to uh, detail our concrete cracks and, and so forth. It's a basically a dental pick uh, with a very it's got a very sharp point. Uh, it's always fun to get these poking around your gums and your teeth, but they make a great uh, it's a great point to get some little divots and cracks in the concrete. Uh, the exacto will tend to look more like a line if you pick it out, more of a straight line. Uh, the pick will make it more, um, a little bit more irregular in shape. And these we could just kind of do randomly here and there where some concrete has fallen out. Uh, you can use this for making cracks as well. Uh, probably finer cracks actually, which is nice. Uh, we don't want them all the same dimension or the same thickness as the X-Acto knife cracks. You can see this is a lot thinner, it's a lot less apparent, but it's subtle, which is good because it just gives it a little bit more variety. So we'll make our way down here with some more smaller cracks. Okay, so I'm using the driftwood stain again. And this is not our final color. In fact, this, it won't be a gray wall at all. Um, it'll be much more of a natural concrete color. But this is just to kill that white plaster and also to see how our cracks uh, turned out. And you can see how everything starts to show up a bit more. Everything is more pronounced and visible as we move down our wall. So I'm trying this um, other stain by Hunterline, and this is their rust color. Um, most of these concrete walls, uh, they always have a rusty tint to them, so I wanted to see if this would work. Uh, it is getting soaked up a lot by the hydrocal, but I think uh, with just a little hint of it, it kind of changes the color a bit um, to a more natural rusted wall, more concrete looking wall. And uh, as we make each uh, layer onto this wall, um, it's, each one is an experiment. I, I don't really make the same wall twice because uh, I'm always trying something new. But um, I'm sure if you looked at 100 concrete walls uh, out there, they're never going to look the same. So there's nothing wrong with uh, changing up your technique every time you do something like this. So now we've got our rust colored uh, tinted wall here. And we're gonna use a bunch of different colors uh, to weather and, and get a really uh, natural looking concrete wall. Uh, one of the main colors is a um, chalk paint. Uh, this is Cocoon, this is from Michael's Art Supply Store. Uh, it's very similar to uh, the old polyscale concrete color. Uh, it's basically a tannish, grayish, white, off-white. Uh, these are some craft paints from Michaels. This is um, home decor chalk paint also. This is Maui sand. 
This is a Martha Stewart color. This is Lake Fog. And then another one called uh, Root Beer Float. And then Arrowhead. These are all good colors for uh, a concrete wall. So I'm mixing a little water into this because I do want it almost more of a wash. And this is one of those things where, um, and if you talk to like an oil painter, an artist, oil painter, uh, you will apply color, but then you'll lose, you'll lose what you're doing. And then we get it back by adding more color and going back and forth. So it's not always going to work out uh, right away. Um, so we'll see if we can get it back. Sometimes you can't, but generally you can. So I'm just trying to, trying to be transparent here. And I'm pushing the color in more than I'm painting it. I'm trying to apply this a little heavier just to get more of this concrete tan color. Um, the rust was nice, but it looks a little too rose colored, uh, a little too pink. So I'm going to apply this coat. It's still transparent. You can still see stuff underneath, which is good. If you notice, I'm working around this um, crumbled sections here at the top because I'm already happy with the color of those as they are. I don't want to. I want. I want them to stand out, so I'm, I'm maintaining some contrast by not adding this color to that section. You'll notice here, this stands out nicely, this crumble, um, this deteriorated patch concrete. This one, I got too much of my color in there, so I'm going to have to get that back. So we're using our black wash again, our driftwood. It's not black, it's a grayish black, I guess. And we're going to just put a little bit into this patch, this crumbling patch, just so it stands out. We went through a little bit of effort to make those, so we want to see them. And this will just highlight all the little shadows in those broken sections, even the cracks if you want. Um, you'll see it'll, those will pop out again. So while we're doing that, we'll Give this another little hit too. You can see how that starts to really look like some old concrete that's just fallen away. So now we're going to add a different color. We're going to use this Arrowhead Gray Acrylic Paint. And you can thin it just a little bit. And we're almost going to start by uh, almost using a dry brushing technique where we don't want to hit the surface too much, but we do want to get some paint on there. Now there's no rhyme or reason to this other than we don't want it to look like a pattern or repetitive. So there's some space in between these patches of darker gray. And then 
an uneven amount, uh, you know, it's, it's not a measured effect. So don't try to do one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight down the line. Just random. I mean, some can be smaller. We don't need them all to be big. And of course, the best thing you can do is look at photos for reference. Look at real concrete walls that have been around for a while and took some weathering and streaking. So you can see here, those are some okay streaks, but they do look like they were made with a paintbrush. So we can take a sponge uh, with our concrete color. This is the chalk paint, um, the cocoon color. Uh, this is a grout sponge. You can get those at Home Depot and then you cut them up in little pieces. And just lightly, randomly, kind of go over these sections. And this will help blend things in a bit. I mean, this is also a form of dry brushing by just applying very little paint and getting some of the highlights. Okay, the next step uh, in weathering this is to use some enamel washes. These are all from AK Interactive. Uh, there's dark, streaming, dark streaking grime, moss deposits, uh, dust and dirt deposits, light rust wash, and a dark brown. So we can take each one and we're mixing with mineral spirits just to see what happens. And what's nice about these is if you put on too much, you can easily dilute them with the mineral spirits. But now that's given it another transparent layer of irregular color, which is really nice. So this you can actually kind of just blob around and then take your mineral spirits and they kind of do the work for you. It's kind of, you can let them streak down into all the cracks naturally. Okay, so I changed my strategy with the uh, low tide line. I was using the enamel uh, wash and it didn't seem to be dark enough and it was just too transparent and it was kind of getting, um, it's, too, too, it's too thin, I need more black than that. So I've mixed some flat black paint with some of that gray arrowhead and I'm just making a uh, much more pronounced muck line. So now I have this darker muck line and it's going to give me more of a solid uh, stable base to work on. So I can go back with now with my green moss deposits and add my algae and the black will kind of stay there without uh, disappearing. And the green will blend in th over the black. So now we need to prepare these wood timbers uh, to apply to our wall. Uh, what we did off camera was take some 1 inch square wood, drag a razor saw across the surface of each side to give it some grain, and then we stained it with our uh, driftwood stain. And what we're doing now is dry brushing each piece with some white paint just to highlight the edges a bit. Okay, so we've cut up our timbers. We've got some vertical pieces that will be spaced uh, evenly and then our horizontal pieces. And we're just using um, some Aileen's Tacky Glue. This is just a strong, fast-drying white glue. And just apply with a toothpick. So 
So this is applied to the top of the wall so it's flush. Okay, we've got all our timber in, and um, you'll notice one thing looks strange is that the timber at the bottom uh, doesn't match our low tide muck. So we have to go back and with our blackish gray paint, hit the bottom of each timber. blends a little bit better and then we'll take some of our moss green again and hit the tops so that blends in a bit so here's our finished wall in place You try to just imagine some water here, and eventually uh, there'll be another wall here, but it'll probably be a stone wall, uh, just to add to some variety and the fact that this isn't there's an older structure over here. So there probably would have been an older wall, <clears throat> and eventually there'll be a structure here, and then we can add some details. We can add some cleats, uh, or some bollards, some ladders, and some signage, uh, and then down here we'll have some some land come down. So we'll have some, some mud flats with some junk. And a few feet away, you can see a similar scene uh, that's finished to give you an idea of what that'll look like. Um, this is the same kind of wall uh, that we just did, um, except it's got, you know, we've poured the water, we've got some low tide junk. Uh, in this case, we've actually broken off sections with a, with a pair of pliers and made it even more severe of a, a derelict wall. Uh, even included some rebar, which is just some point, uh, zero one zero wire painted a rust color. But it's basically the same exact technique.